1954, Professor Tolkien wrote that of all the Istari, one only remained faithful, Gandalf. For Radagast the fourth became enamoured of the many beasts and birds that dwelt in Middle-earth, and forsook elves and men, and spent his days among wild creatures. So did Radagast fail? I mean, there's no doubt that Saruman failed, and no doubt that Gandalf didn't, but what of Radagast the Brown? Maya, Gavan, and Melanine are Menix Wilaid. My name's Rainbow Dave, and welcome to another Tolkien Untangled lore video. Today, I will be focusing on the mystery that is the Brown Wizard, Radagast, and I'll try to get to the bottom of why Tolkien implied him to be a failure, and why Radagast is still an awesome character nevertheless. But let's begin with a quick overview of who exactly Radagast is, where he came from, and what he got up to during the Third Age. So just like all five members of the Istari, the wizards, Radagast was not always an old man robed in brown, and he was not always known as Radagast. At some point in the early Third Age, Manwë, the king of the Valar, so kind of like the king of the gods, summoned a council in the uttermost west, and he invited a number of the other most powerful Valar from among their pantheon, and some of the Maya, who are sort of like angels or demigods in Tolkien's writings. And Manwë summoned this divine council to discuss the growing threat of Sauron's return in Middle-earth. Now, I talked about this in great detail in my last video about the Istari, so check this out if you haven't already to learn more, but the long and short of it is that the Valar decided to send five of their Maya to Middle-earth to aid the three peoples in their resistance against Sauron. But they were not sent as warriors or as sorcerer kings, they were simply to act as guides and helpers who would aid the free peoples but not rule them, and they would not challenge Sauron themselves. And so these five Maya were stripped of most of their powers, they were stripped of most of their memories, and they were bound in the limited bodies as of men subject to the fears and pains and weariness of earth, able to hunger and thirst and be slain. And so these five former Maya became the five Istari, the five wizards. But very interestingly, the wizard who became known as Radagast was not originally intended to be one of them. Back in the uttermost west, there was once a Maya called Iwendil, which means lover of birds, or friend of birds, and he served a great lady of the Valar called Yavanna, the queen of fruits and trees and all growing things. And Yavanna was the wife of a guy called Aule, the smith, the craftsman of the Valar, and it was Aule who chose a Maya called Kuromo to be the first of the Istari, the white wizard who would become known in Middle-earth as Saruman. And the reason that this is relevant to Radagast is because there is a fascinating little connection between Radagast and Saruman that goes back to the very, very beginning. Kuromo was chosen by Aule, and Iowendil was chosen by Aule's wife. But we are told that Yavanna didn't just ask Kurumo to take Iwendil with him, she had to beg Kurumo. Which means, I guess, either Yavanna really wanted to be rid of Iwendil, which I hope isn't the case because both Yavanna and Iwendil seem like lovely people, or, more likely, it means Kurumo really didn't want to take Iwendil with him. And I think this is worth pointing out, this is very important in what I'm going to talk about later in this video, because even from the very beginning there seems to be some sort of a reluctant link between Saruman and Radagast, and yet in most ways they are complete opposites. Anyway, after Iwendil arrived in Middle-earth bound in the body of an old man, he became known as Radagast the Brown. And the first thing to say about Radagast after arriving at the Grey Havens is that he pretty immediately journeyed over the Misty Mountains and came to the vast forest 
of Greenwood, which would shortly become known as Mirkwood. And there he stayed, perhaps for the rest of Middle Earth's history, settled in his woodland home called Roscobel. As his name implies, Radagast was a lover of birds and beasts, and while the other wizards concerned themselves with men and elves, and in Gandalf's case, dwarves and hobbits, Radagast preferred the company of animals. We are told that he did have some dealings with the woodsmen of Mirkwood, and Bayorn the Skin Changer did state in The Hobbit that he was not a bad fellow, but generally most of Radagast's friends were wild animals. And by far the most iconic of all of Radagast's friends are the Great Eagles, the servants of Manwe. So the next question is, what do we know about Radagast's actions before and during the Lord of the Rings? Well, the answer to that is not much. His name is mentioned once in The Hobbit, where Gandalf refers to him as his good cousin, but until The Lord of the Rings, he is like a ghost of Middle-earth. He is a mighty character who we know existed for over 2,000 years, but beyond that, we know next to nothing about him. However, in The Lord of the Rings, Radagast does appear pretty early on. Months before Frodo goes off on his quest to Mordor, Radagast journeys once more across the Misty Mountains in order to find Gandalf and to deliver to him a message. On Midsummer's Day, Gandalf finds Radagast just outside of Bree, and Radagast warns him that the Nazgûl are abroad and they are searching for a place called the Shire. However, Radagast also has another message to deliver to Gandalf, and this is a message from Saruman. Radagast tells Gandalf that he must go to Orthanc, for Saruman wishes to speak with him. Now, as I imagine we all know, this turns out to be a trap, and when Gandalf arrives at Orthanc, he is imprisoned by his former friend Saruman. And at this moment in the story, Gandalf doesn't really know what to make of Radagast. Is he a traitor who knowingly deceived Gandalf on Saruman's orders, or was he unknowingly manipulated by Saruman? Well, the answer to this question comes in the form of a great eagle, Gwaihir the Windlord to be specific. In the final chapter of the Silmarillion, of all places, we are told that Radagast the Brown inadvertently aided Saruman in his hunt for the One Ring, but he did not do so knowingly. Saruman gathered a great host of spies, and many of these were birds, for Radagast lent him aid, divining naught of his treachery, and deeming that this was but part of the watch upon the enemy. And so, while Saruman was revealing his treachery to both Sauron and the Free Peoples, and while Gandalf was captive in Orthanc after uncovering the truth of the One Ring's location, Radagast was just kind of plodding on with his own thing, befriending birds and beasts, and sometimes sending those birds to Saruman and Gandalf as messengers. However, it is in this part of the story that we see Radagast's most important contribution to the War of the Ring. Because despite Gandalf's concerns, Radagast never was in any way a willing ally of Saruman's after his turn to treachery. He did not send Gandalf into Saruman's trap knowingly, he just did as he was told. And then he did as he was told again. Before Gandalf left Radagast on Midsummer's Day to ride off to Orthanc, he told Radagast to send out messages to all the birds and beasts that are your friends. Tell them to bring news to Saruman and Gandalf. And this is a massive part of why Saruman's plan to capture the One Ring right at the beginning of the story failed. Saruman underestimated Radagast. Now, I'll talk more about this Radagast-Saruman connection in just a few minutes, but I think it's very interesting to note that Saruman the Wise has a really low opinion of Radagast the Simple. Saruman believed that Radagast was just too stupid to be an outright accomplice, and so he concealed his mind and deceived his messenger. 
And to be fair, this probably was actually the right choice. From Saruman's perspective, we are told that Gandalf caught no hint of anything wrong in Radagast's voice or in his eye, and if he had, he would not have gone to Isengard. Also, Tolkien tells us that it would have been useless to try and win over the honest Radagast to treachery. But because Saruman made no attempt to deal with Radagast beyond that, the undoing of his plot was begun. Radagast saw no reason not to do as Gandalf had asked, and so he sent one of his bird friends, aka Gwaihir the frickin' Windlord, to Isengard to deliver the information to Gandalf and Saruman that Gandalf had requested. Eight days after Gandalf's imprisonment in Orthanc, Gwaihir came to Isengard with tidings of gathering wolves and mustering orcs and the movements of the Black Riders and the escape of Gollum. But when Gwaihir arrived, he found that there were already orcs and wolves in the service of Saruman and that Gandalf was his prisoner. And so the Great Eagle rescued Gandalf and he bore him to Edoras, where Gandalf would then go on to befriend Shadowfax and together they would ride way back up into the north. Which means Radagast serves as both the source of Gandalf's imprisonment in Isengard and also the reason for his rescue. But then Radagast completely disappears from the story. After the Council of Elrond, we are told that elven scouts of Rivendell journeyed over the Misty Mountains to Mirkwood to find Radagast. But when they came to Roscobel, Radagast was not there. He simply vanishes from the entire narrative, never to be mentioned in the Lord of the Rings again. I guess we could speculate that perhaps Radagast played some sort of a role in getting Gwaihir and the other eagles to the Black Gate, you know, towards the end of the Return of the King, and maybe he remains in Middle-earth long into the Fourth Age, but we just don't know. Radagast is one of the great dangling threads that Tolkien never tied up. However, there is still an awful lot to be said about this character, and from the story that I've just told, it is kind of hard to see how Radagast is a failure. I feel like in some cases, Radagast is sometimes portrayed as being a bit of a lesser wizard, whose power and knowledge isn't quite on par with Gandalf's or Saruman's, and he's a, a bit of a lackey or a sidekick. And although there may be some truth in this, I certainly don't think Radagast is a joke. In fact, I think his relative lack of, you know, showy grandeur is part of what makes him so fascinating. And we know that he is not without at least some might. Again, during the Council of Elrond, Gandalf tells us that Radagast is, of course, a worthy wizard, a master of shapes and changer of hue and he has much lore of herbs and beasts. Now, Master of Shapes and Changer of Hue is a very cool little detail, but it's pretty open to interpretation. On the one hand, Master of Shapes sounds to me a little bit like shapeshifting, right? But as cool as that would be, I don't think this is what Tolkien intended. It's true that Bayorn and his people are skin changers, but I don't think Radagast has the power to turn into an animal. The whole point of the Istari is that they are bound inside incarnate bodies. If Radagast could change his form at will, then he wouldn't really be a wizard. So the way I imagine this instead is that Radagast is a master of camouflage. He can walk unseen through the woods and blend in almost perfectly with his environment. But I suppose it is possible that Radagast could maybe cast some sort of an illusion that might change the appearance of his shape. Honestly, all we can do here is speculate. However, when we think about Radagast, it is pretty impossible not to also think of the other two wizards that he rubbed shoulders with, Gandalf and Saruman. And I'm not mentioning the blue wizards here, just because whichever version of their story you choose to go with, it has nothing to do with like Radagast or the other much more famous Third Age wizards. Anyway, in Tolkien's own writings, Radagast is very directly compared to Gandalf, but honestly, the comparison is not particularly flattering to Radagast. In that Istari essay from the Unfinished Tales, 
Tolkien implies that just like Saruman, Radagast failed in his mission. Although he failed in a very different way to Saruman. Of all the Istari, one only remained faithful, for Radagast the Fourth forsook elves and men. And in a section of Morgoth's ring, we are told that Sauron considered Gandalf to be nothing more than a rather cleverer Radagast. Cleverer because it is more profitable, more productive of power to become absorbed in the study of people than of animals. And lastly, in the Lord of the Rings Reader's Companion, we are told that Gandalf differed from Radagast and Saruman in that he never turned aside from his appointed mission. Now, if you're a massive Radagast fan, as I myself am, then this can be quite difficult to read. You know, I, I don't want to think of Radagast being lumped in the same category as Saruman. Saruman sucks. But to get to the bottom of why Tolkien once considered Radagast a failure, we need to take a look at what exactly this appointed mission was. What was it that Radagast supposedly failed at? Well, the short answer is guiding the free peoples in their resistance against Sauron. You know, that is the purpose that he came to Middle-earth with. That's the point of why the wizards even exist in the first place. It's why the Valar sent them. And in this task, yeah, you know what, fair enough, Radagast did kind of fail. I can't really disagree with Tolkien on that. If we look at the mind-boggling number of ways in which Gandalf aided the Free Peoples and the hundreds of strings that he was pulling at the end of the Third Age to ensure Sauron's downfall, and then we compare that to Radagast's contributions, which were basically just unknowingly providing the information that got Gandalf captured, and then unknowingly providing the eagle that allowed him to escape, it's not a close contest. The task was to help bring about Sauron's ultimate ruin, to befriend the free peoples and guide them to victory against the Dark Lord. In that task, Gandalf succeeded spectacularly, and Radagast, well, he succeeded in befriending some birds, and also some beasts, but not like, you know, the Dunedain or the Noldor, or even hobbits, or any of the real movers and shakers in Middle-earth. We can, I guess, speculate perhaps that he had some sort of relationship with Thranduil's elves, but there is no evidence to support this. Thranduil lived in the north of Mirkwood, Radagast lived in the south, and Tolkien gives us no reason to believe that these two characters had any sort of a significant relationship. What he does tell us, however, is that Radagast was fond of birds and beasts and found them easier to deal with. He did not become proud and domineering, but neglectful and easygoing. And he had very little to do with elves and men, although obviously resistance to Sauron had to be sought chiefly in their cooperation. So, if we agree that Radagast's appointed mission was to aid the elves and men of Middle-earth, then yeah, it is hard to argue that he didn't fail. However, I think there might be a little bit more to this than initially meets the eye. Because if we go all the way back to the beginning of the wizard story, to that divine council of the Valars, the one where King Manwe chose to send Maya emissaries to Middle-earth in the limited forms of the Istari, then we'll see an interesting detail. The original number of Istari was intended not to be five, but three. Saruman the White, Alatar the Blue, and Gandalf the Grey. Radagast was not originally one of them. And it was not Manwe who originally sent him. It was Yavanna, the giver of fruits and the lady of all growing things. And Radagast, or Iwendil as he was known back then, joined the three Istari as a bit of an afterthought. He was wizard number four. And so, perhaps, we can speculate that Radagast was, to an extent, exempt from the appointed mission that was given by Manwe to Saruman, Alatar, and Gandalf, and instead Radagast went with a mission from Yavanna. In The Unfinished Tales, Tolkien writes about Yavanna's evident desire that the Istari should include in their number one with particular love of the things of her making. 
and he says that this could only be achieved by imposing Radagast's company upon Saruman. And if Radagast were given an extra mission by Yavanna to help protect the trees and growing things of Middle-earth as well as guide its free peoples, then certainly I think we can say that Radagast was not an absolute failure. He did, I imagine, exactly what Yavanna would have wanted him to. In a 1962 letter that Tolkien wrote to one of his aunts, he said that every tree has its enemy, few have an advocate. Within the fiction of his legendarium, this exact sentiment is what prompts Yavanna to create the first Ents way back in the beginning as a type of protection for her beloved forests. And so maybe she sent Radagast as another kind of protector, a friend to all the growing things that have so many enemies and so few advocates. And this may also explain why Radagast is never mentioned again after the beginning of The Lord of the Rings. The War of the Ring is not his story, it's not his purpose. Obviously, if Sauron ended up winning and taking control of Middle-earth, then Radagast's animal friends in the woodlands would surely be in dire need of his protection, but if the Free Peoples win, then the forests will still come under threat. When Sauron fell, Gandalf's task was done, but perhaps Radagast's wasn't. We all know that Gandalf sailed west after the downfall of the Dark Lord, but Radagast's fate? That is never ever mentioned. Except that one year before the end of his life, Tolkien wrote a little 16 line alliterative verse poem in which he mentions quite a few different Middle Earth topics, but the first three lines of that poem went like this. Wilt thou learn the lore that was long secret of the five that came from a far country? Only one returned, others never again. Now, these five that came are pretty unambiguously the wizards, and the one only who returned is clearly Gandalf, but this fairly explicitly states that neither Radagast nor any other wizard ever sailed west with him. Saruman was obviously killed in Middle-earth and his spirit was blown away on a westerly wind as he deserved. The blue wizards are a complete mystery, and so too is Radagast. He failed to accomplish the mission of Gandalf and Saruman, but perhaps he did not stay in Middle-earth as a punishment for this failure, perhaps he stayed because he still had a task to do. I guess it's very easy to think of Radagast as being a bit like Gandalf Light, you know, or a sort of Gandalf sidekick, but that is absolutely not what he is. He may have been first introduced in The Hobbit as Gandalf's cousin, but by the end of his life, I think Tolkien had a much more nuanced opinion of the character than that. And to be honest, if Radagast is anybody's lackey, I would say he is closer to being Saruman's than Gandalf's, or at least he had the potential to be. I talked at the beginning of this video about that complicated connection that exists between Saruman and Radagast from the very beginning, and I actually think Radagast is at his most interesting when he's being compared to the other wizard that failed instead of the one who didn't. Remember, Radagast, or Iwendil, was chosen to be one of the Istar because Lady Yavanna begged for him to be taken along with the other three. But she didn't beg Gandalf to take Radagast with him, she begged Saruman. Radagast went to Middle-earth as Saruman's companion, and during his only real role in The Lord of the Rings, he serves as Saruman's unwitting messenger. And yet Saruman seems to have an incredibly low opinion of Radagast. He describes him as Radagast the bird tamer, Radagast the simple, Radagast the fool. And this very mean-spirited language reminds me a little bit of how Saruman talks to Grima Wormtongue. Perhaps Saruman originally intended for Radagast to be his servant, and for Radagast to fulfil the role that Wormtongue eventually went on to do. 
But because Radagast simply did not care enough about the task he'd been sent to do, or perhaps because he'd been sent to do a different task, he lacked the ambition or the pride that Saruman required to corrupt him. Maybe Radagast's failure, as Tolkien puts it, is actually what stopped him from becoming Saruman's henchman. In the end, Middle-earth really only needed one Gandalf, but two Sarumans would have been disastrous. All three of the Third Age wizards were sent to Middle-earth with a purpose, but they all ended up doing very different things. You know, Gandalf's take on the whole mission was, yeah, you know what, actually I will help the Free Peoples like I'm supposed to. Saruman was more like, nah, I'm gonna rule the Free People, but Radagast was of the opinion that both of those choices sounded like a lot of hard work, and honestly, I think he would just rather take it easy in Mirkwood. Gandalf succeeded in doing what he had to, Saruman failed in doing what he wanted to, and Radagast just sort of disappeared to hang out with his animal friends. But I respect that. That's the point I'm trying to make. Perhaps if Radagast had taken a more active role in the story, and he had done a better job at guiding the elves and men of the Third Age, then when Gandalf fell fighting the Balrog in Moria, he might never have been sent back as Gandalf the White. Instead, Radagast might have just taken Gandalf's place, but without all his knowledge of Western Middle-earth and without the friendships that he'd forged over the span of that age, Radagast would not have been enough to guide the Free Peoples to victory. Or perhaps if he'd taken the whole Sauron Ringlaw thing way more seriously, like Saruman did, Radagast may have been corrupted by it, and Middle-earth may have been stuck with two Dark Wizards. But as it goes, Radagast did neither of those things. He was just a friend to birds and beasts, and he presumably remained with his friends long into the Fourth Age, where I guess he would have lived forever as an old man of the forest, free from ambition or great responsibility or any of the trappings of power. I think the reason that I like Radagast so much is that unlike many of my other favourite characters, Radagast is pretty easy to relate to. I mean, obviously he's a magical wizard who's lived for thousands of years and I'm not, but his personality is something that I can definitely recognise in myself. Like, you know, it would be very nice to be as wise as Gandalf, or as incredible as Galadriel, or as wonderfully pure-hearted as Frodo, but at least I have the self-awareness to know that I'm not. But Radagast, a guy with a fondness for animals who finds them easier to deal with than the constantly shifting politics of elves and dwarves and men, yeah, I can understand where he's coming from there. He's nowhere near as heroically epic as Gandalf, but he's also nowhere near as arrogant and domineering as Saruman. Pride and ambition are character traits that Tolkien explores a great deal throughout his Middle-earth writings, and we see the negative effects of these traits over and over again in Neil Melkor, in Sauron, in Feanor, in Artharazon, in Saruman, in Denethor even to an extent. We see it all over the place, but not in Radagast. He is the complete opposite. If Radagast has a character flaw, it's that he's too laid back and easygoing. And perhaps he does fail because of it. But he is never corrupted. He never does anything harmful. He just makes friends and lets his metaphorical cousin Gandalf deal with the rest of the heavy lifting. And honestly, I cannot condemn him for that. I think if we are going to fail in life, you know, if you have to fail, then fail like Radagast. There are so many worse ways for us to live our lives. Anyway, there are my thoughts and findings on Radagast the Brown. I hope you enjoyed them. And if you want to learn more about the Wizards of Middle-earth, then make sure you check out last week's video all about the other four wizards of the Astari. And if you want to go into more detail on a specific one, then check out these lore videos about Gandalf, Saruman, and the super mysterious Blue Wizards. 
And the reason I'm suggesting these older videos is because this will have to be the last video that I release for a little while. I will absolutely return, but I've been releasing a new video every week now for the past six months, and I do have other things that I need to work on. But I promise I will not be gone from YouTube for too long, and when I do return, I will continue with my first age Silmarillion really Explained series, where I will talk about the greatest battle yet, the fifth battle for Beleriand. And after that, I'll give the epic tale of the children of Hurin the full Tolkien Untangled treatment. So to make sure you don't miss any of those future videos, hit subscribe and hit like and leave a comment on this video if you want to, and if you're a fan then be sure to share this channel with your friends. But as always, until next time my dear friends, much love, stay groovy, and Nevaya Melanine.